And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. That's right, Greta, you pint-sized protagonist. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday protest climate realism show the new name episode 101 electric trains planes and automobiles going nowhere fast i'm your host anthony watts senior fellow for environment and climate at the heartland institute joining us today our regular panelist dr h sterling burnett director of the arthur b robinson center and linnea lucan a research fellow at the robinson center welcome guys and happy friday happy friday and today is hat day Today is hat day, and I'm wearing my Texas Rangers official world championship, uh, uh, the, the greatest team sports victory in the history of mankind. And, of course, everyone knows I don't exaggerate. Well, you're certainly justified in wearing that. Um, <laughs> it, you know, they did a great job. It really was a great Great thing. Anyway, we're going to get to our regular topic, our main topic, planes, trains, and automobiles in just a little bit. But first... Crazy climate news of the week. And boy, have we got some for you this week. Scientists want to build a 62-mile-long curtain around the Doomsday Glacier to basically contain all that meltwater. $50 billion. A Hail Mary. Yeah, right. That's going to work. What do you think? Sterling? Uh -uh. I'm almost at a loss as to have anything to think. It's just so idiotic. <laughs> you know, what, what, you know, what are they going to, is the curtain going to be black? So it absorbs heat. Is it going to be white? So it reflects heat. Uh, it, it, how did they tuck it under the glacier? So it doesn't melt or move. Uh, if it's translucent, well, it might magnify the sun's rays, uh, act as a, 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 you know, like a, a spyglass, um, the, the the old magnifying glass that you used to you know burn up insects with uh it, it, it's just it, it's idiotic and this has happened look glaciers it has melted in the past it has recovered uh all without human intervention either in the melting or the recovery and this is just one more stupid stupid it's Tell us like how you really kid, feel. <laughs> it's a kid's yeah, it's a kid's science, it, it's a kid's science fiction story, is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 not even good science fiction. Good. Yeah. Um uh, it's science fantasy. That's really what it is. Um and and, and you know, and the first time some sea mammal gets trapped inside the curtain. Oh, yeah, then what are they gonna do, right? Yeah, all your all your uh, your uh, your penguins migrate over there, and then they get trapped and can't feed, and all their young die, and that'll be climate change's fault, by the way. Yeah, right. That's climate change's fault, not the idiocy of the so-called scientists. The all curtain. right. Speaking of idiocy, historic dam removal in California. Now, there's been this issue with the Klamath River in northeastern California, and the environmentalist have been wanting to take out the dams for years because, oh no, the salmon can't make it upstream. So we're going to get rid of all the dams. And in the process, getting rid of the dams, we're going to put hundreds, if not thousands of people out of business, you know, that are farming in the area, livelihoods for families. But we're not going to worry about that. No, we're not going to worry about that at all. It's the salmon that are important. We got to save the fish. And guess what? They took the dam out and then they killed all the salmon. They had all these fingerlings in the river, and they all got squished in the new tube or whatever. Plus that, there's huge amounts of muck, sediment, mire that's now polluting the main river. 
Yeah. It's an environmental disaster caused by environmentalists. And of course, a disaster in another way. It's not just the Klamath. It's, it's rivers all around the Northwest. They're taking dams down. These dams weren't put there for no reason, by the way. <laughs> they, provide, yeah. they provide hydropower. Most of them have ladders for salmon to go around. Um, but so they're taking out the only reliable, relatively reliable renewable source of power <laughs> in the region uh, yeah. that keeps the lights on in California and elsewhere. They're taking those dams out. They're killing the salmon downstream and they're doing nothing about the sea lions and uh, uh, seals that are uh, feasting at the mouths of the rivers at the salmon come back because they're no longer harassed or hunted by humans. Right. They're protected right. instead. So it's one government created problem after another with the solution never, well, let's fix the initial problem. They just make it worse. Yeah, I know. The, the environmentalist movement. Whoops. He's it, been taken and, out. Yeah. Yeah. And then they don't look around as to what the, you know, the repercussions might be. Um, and it, it's, it's the, we see the same thing again and again and again, like with offshore wind power and whales, you know? Uh, anyway. Renea, do you have something to say about this? Oh, me on the salmon? Well, mm. I don't know. I My only commentary was going to be that it's not hard to build a fish ladder. Um, most dams, I think, do have them at this point. They do. Um, apparently, the, the fish were sucked through the tube and they were uh, killed by the increased water pressure, which is something that they had to have had engineers on this. And so the engineers must have told them that this was going to happen and they just didn't listen, I guess. Um, they are, they're now putting the fish downstream manually from what I understood in the articles uh, to avoid this from happening again until they're able to fully remove the dam. Um, but it's still, it is kind of insane that, you know, hydropower is a very good renewable in the areas that it works. It works very well and consistently for the most part, um, far more consistently than wind or solar do. And yet this is the one that they don't like. Starting to no. think that maybe inefficiency is the goal, you know. <laughs> well, of course, and if they're putting them no. downstream, that's just, well, they could have put them downstream with the dam still there. Right. <laughs> there was already a stream, folks. Just put them there if that's where they're going to go in the first, if you're going to put them in the first place. It's it's like, yeah. It, yeah. It's, well, once and, again, and, and there I they think, go. I think Linnea may be too charitable. She thinks they hired engineers for this. My suspicion is <laughs> they hired environmental engineers who, who studied the new math where one and one doesn't necessarily equal two. It's subjective. It depends on your feelings. And uh, this is the result. Yeah. Once again, they put the mental in environmentalism. All right. <laughs> let's go to the next one. We've got uh, this guy who's smuggling greenhouse gases. This is hilarious. Mm -hmm. This is like something out of the Babylon Bee. This guy is smuggling refrigerant <clears throat> from Mexico into the United States. And instead of just simply saying there, he's smuggling refrigerant to keep the old refrigerators working because there is a market for it, even if it is a black market. They say, no, he's smuggling greenhouse gases. Oh, my goodness. It just, it, it's, and again, and this is what happens. Environmentalism says, oh, the ozone hole, the ozone hole, we got to save it. We got to save it. And so we go down this path of getting rid of these refrigerants, which some people suspect had absolutely nothing to do with the ozone hole, but had to do with the patent expiration that DuPont held for the refrigerants of the time. So then we got to create new refrigerants to save the ozone hole, but we got a patent on those that last for another 17 years. So there you go. But anyway, uh, so now there's smuggling of greenhouse gases. And uh, I can't wait for someone to be arrested for uh, driving a carbon dioxide tanker. That's going to be great. Well, you know, the black market in uh, in CFCs and others have been around for a while. I hadn't heard about the smuggling from Mexico, but you know, he was he was not very smart because if it, it's not easy, I, I, I've noticed on my border, it's not easy to get illegal things across the border of Texas. I mean, it's not hard. Things 
people come across daily. And if a cartel wanted to get into this, they could put a, a, C, a CFC tube in everyone's backpack as they come across <laughs> and, and DPS, you know, the greenhouse the, gas mules. Yeah. Greenhouse <laughs> gas mules. And, and the, and the government's idea would be hands off. We've got to let's ship them to Chicago um, via planes. Uh, Cause we certainly can't arrest them for breaking the law. You can rob people. You can kill people. We don't arrest you for breaking the law. So, are they really going to be arrested if they're smuggling greenhouse gases? I, I suspect not. Yeah. Oh. Now, Leah, you've been awfully quiet during this crazy part of the show. I'm Is it keeping just too up crazy with our... for you to comment on. I'll almost. Uh, I'm keeping up with our fantastic audience here. Um, we uh, we have a lot of comments today. Everyone's having a good time. Uh, I don't know. I guess he was just. That guy was gonna was suspected of committing a uh, or planning to commit an ozone attack. So, <laughs> an ozone attack. There you go. Oh my goodness! All right, let's move on to cartoons. There have been a number of cartoons the last couple of weeks. Uh, apparently, uh, now you know there's a mandate for uh, EV Wait. lemons with the UAW and uh, more expensive, less range, less jobs. That's all good for the planet, but not so good for the UAW. But apparently they're going along with it because there must be some kickback in there somewhere. That's how those guys operate. All right, next cartoon. We've got um, one about the electric Daytona 500. Yes, indeed. They want to make the Daytona 500 electric. Wow. The thrill, the speed, the noise, the recharging weight. It's all fun. Yeah, the recharging weight. And, and then when they have a crash... Uh, they can't put the fire up. Yeah, they have to cancel the race and and restart two days later. Um, you know, but I want to go. Back, I want to go back just for a second to that guy getting arrested. We have worried for some time about uh, people being declared climate criminals and prosecutions. He may be the first example. It, it's not. It's not paranoid. It's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. Yep. Yep. Climate criminals. And finally, Greta. Uh, Dare Leonardo da Vinci use oil paint? This happens to be something I found on the internet. It's true. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our main topic. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Electric version. Of course, we all know that hurricanes and electric vehicles don't mix, particularly when the salt water gets involved. Um, and, you know, it doesn't even take hurricanes to cause electric cars to go K-boom. No, they'll just do it on their own. You know, the, the movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, it's all about these different modes of transportation, you know? And they all fail badly in the movie, leaving Steve Martin stuck with John Candy in these hilarious situations. And now with net zero being the latest nonsensical climate goal, we noticed that for quite a while, these different modes of transportation, now electrified, are failing just as badly as what went on during the movie. In fact, we regularly see electric cars standing by cold weather, or out of charge, or spontaneously catching fire, just like what happened in the movie. Let's roll this clip. <laughs> yeah, what? That, that's basically the sum total of it, you know? That, we see this with electric cars now on a regular basis. In fact, with the hurricane situation, Hurricane Ian, uh, one of the auto junkers that has, you know, that hauled all these things away because they wouldn't run anymore, decided he's going to put them in this parking lot all by themselves and give them 50-foot spacing so that when one spontaneously combusts, it doesn't set the rest of them on fire, hmm. right? But what Very... about the grass? <laughs> That's what I thought. That grass looked a little parched to me. I, I was about to say, it looked like a yeah. pretty much a dirt lot, but but I, I'm not convinced that for a uh, auto junker yard, that is a very efficient use of space. But that's just me. Uh, 
Well, I've been to a few like, of them. They they it, seem to stack these things up in most instances. You 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 go and and pull out your own thing. I, I, I'm not going there for sure. Well, <laughs> well, Sterling, I think it's probably a better use of space than having your entire junkyard burned down. <laughs> yeah, perhaps so. Well, you know, it is what it is, but. Um, Planes, trains, and automobiles are all being electrified now, um, you know, and um, I don't, I haven't seen this video. What's this one? Oh, there we go. There's one up in flames. Yeah, just along the side of the road. Just normal weather, normal travel, catching fire. I saw that. I saw that a couple of years ago uh, on my way uh, back from Austin through Denton. There was a, an EV with no apparent accident damage i think that it was just it overheated in in uh rush hour traffic and they had to clear the highway yep <laughs> keeps the street warm you know electric planes have yet to capture the public attention mainly because given what we've seen with electric cars and their track record who wants to be on an electric airplane <laughs> I mean, seriously, do you want to be on an electric airplane that might spontaneously combust? Mm. Yeah. And, well, I, and, I'm, I'm skeptical that that will ever, you take know, at off. least in terms, of, yeah, will ever take <laughs> off. <laughs> Terrible. Um, with the, uh, especially when you it comes to passenger plane, like large passenger planes and uh, cargo mm. planes and stuff like that. I just don't see how that could be electrified with current technology, uh, at least on battery, because the battery itself would have to weigh, I don't know. I, it, it, the numbers aren't adding up in my head when I'm <laughs> plugging them together pretty roughly, uh, especially considering normal uh, road vehicles, the electric versions of them are far heavier than normal and you have less range. So I can't imagine that an electric 747 would do very much good for anyone, even if it didn't just spontaneously catch on fire mid-flight. Well, you just you just put solar panels on the wings, and and I'm sure they won't blow off. Uh, you can strap them down. Of course, that adds extra weight. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how they think this is going to work. There may be a new battery that comes along. I have no doubt they're improving battery technologies, uh, but still, not me. Thank you. You might be able to come up with some kind of a hybrid electric situation. Um, you know, Formula One cars are part electric, um, but I, still. Well, uh, train engines are, are yeah. diesel uh, electric, right? Um, they're, they're, they're hybrids. They have been for some time. Uh, yeah, electric... the, the diesel engine powers the electric generator. The electric yeah. generator powers the trucks. Right. So I... I there, it's not the case that elect that electric uh, vehicles are always and all time a, a not bad idea. You know, we talked the the first notion was trains, right? Well, we got electric trains everywhere, and uh, but but they're powered a different different way. They're not battery powered trains. Right. They're hooked up to overhead lines. Uh, right. They, they they run along specific routes and corridors. Uh, and they're taking a charge directly from uh, the power system. That's a very different thing than a battery-powered uh, train. I will it's say, though, um, a Boeing being at the forefront of this doesn't give me, at this point in time, very much <laughs> comfort. <laughs> don't, don't say that, Linnea. I have Boeing stock. Don't, don't, don't crash Boeing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sterling, but just today, another set of uh, uh, landing gear fell off you're, another you're Boeing. Me here. <laughs> you're killing me here. My portfolio is suffering. Every, yeah. every word so, you speak. So I, after uh, Boeing and NASA worked together to produce an electric plane, they decided, well, you know what? This ain't going to work. <laughs> so they killed the plan, citing safety concerns, because the decision not to apply the uh, to fly it came about because the agency discovered that the propulsion system had the potential to fail and put people at risk. Gosh, who would have Imagine thought? that. Yeah, imagine yeah. that. Well, you know, um, uh, I forget it. Just forget it. <laughs> 
You're just beside yourself too today, Sterling. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, we've got these uh, electric buses, right? They're catching fire left and right. Electric scooters burning down entire buildings, killing people in New York. Um, it, it, why anyone thinks that these are, are a good idea? Oh, yeah. The entire fleet gets taken out here. Yeah, that old video. That's I good. think it's not that. I mean, it's 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 only a couple of years old. And remember, this video, I believe, is uh, is Connecticut is uh, is Bridgeport, Connecticut's proud electric bus fleet. That the day uh, before this fire uh, took hold, the the governor was proudly proclaiming that they were going to go all electric in their fleet in the state of buses, of public buses. And this happens the very next day and they have to pull them all and say, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, if the, they are constantly, they are constantly saying, we need to get out of our cars. We need more public transportation. We need more. And then what they want to do is put people in, uh, in tender boxes. Let's put them in, in, in ovens that could go off at any second. That's good for the public. I guess they just don't care about the poor and middle class who are the ones that typically take that. I don't see many millionaires and billionaires on electric buses. So maybe they just don't care. Uh, it's not their kids. Their kids are going to private school. So maybe they don't care if school buses spontaneously erupt or strand you in the middle of a main winter on a back road. Uh, yeah. It's just the whole idea of electric cars was killed over a hundred years ago. I mean, there were yep. at the very beginning of Nearly the automobile 200. revolution, we had a couple of, of electric cars, one called the Detroit electric. It looked like a, you know, an early version of the model T and it worked, but it only had a range of like 25 miles or something, which was fine for the time because towns were smaller. There were no interstates or freeways or whatever. But the bottom line is even though that car worked for the environment that it was built for, it was surpassed by the internal combustion engine driven cars because they were so much better. And that's the whole thing. We keep getting pushed these, you know, these electric cars pushed on us and they're not better. They don't have better range. They don't have better safety records. They don't have anything going for them. And yet we're supposed to just like give up these habits of, you know, driving a gasoline engine vehicle and go for these electrics. And some people have done this. And what they've found is, hey, it doesn't live up to the hype. A lot of people who have owned electric vehicles, me included, have, you know, gone through the process and discovered they do not handle the long term or the distance. Let's, you know, Anthony, you mentioned electric cars have been around for uh, over 100 years now. The first electric vehicle this technology, the government has said, we need to finance wind and solar. We need to finance EVs. Why? Because they're orphan technologies. They're new technologies, and we've got to get them started. We've just got to get some initial financing to get them started. No. The first electric vehicle was a train put on the tracks in 1837, nearly 200 years ago. It couldn't compete with steam, coal, and steam engines, right? Uh, they said, well, it's the batteries, the problem. The first electric renewable rechargeable battery was 1857 or nine. I wrote about this today in Climate Change Weekly. Uh, people, people think that these are rechargeable batteries, new things, never happened before. No, 1857, still couldn't compete. Then you had electric cars. They had to compete with the internal combustion. They failed. These aren't new technologies. And they don't support, they don't, merit government support, especially since they ain't cleaning up the environment. Uh, they're dirtier than internal combustion engine vehicles through their manufacture, uh, through their operation, it turns out, in a lot of ways. Uh, they're not saving the planet from climate change as if it needs saving, as if we have the power to do that. Um, there is nothing to recommend these things other than if you don't get me wrong, if someone wants to buy an electric vehicle, I'm very happy for them to do so, but I shouldn't have to subsidize them. Yeah. Well, 
So here's the fun part. Now they're talking about electric locomotives, some company called Wabtec. And last year, they revealed their first battery electric locomotive. And guess what? It's pink. I mean, if you're, if you're producing something for the very first time to show to the world, what better choice could you make for rejection than pink? Why in that? If, well, if they want to get it accepted, they should make it a ro rainbow color, right? That's the age we live in. Oh. Yeah, anyway. definitely. Oh, man. Um, I found something the other day online that I think I'll, I'll read it off for you guys. I, I forgot to send okay. it in the chat, but it's, it's a good little example of what we're talking about here. It says, imagine we lived in a world where all cars were already EVs. And then along comes this new invention, the internal combustion engine. Yep. Think about how well it would sell a vehicle that's half the weight, half the price, almost a quarter of the damage done to the road. It can be refueled in one tenth of the time and has a range of up to four times the distance in all weather conditions. It does not rely on environmentally damaging use of non-renewable rare earths to power it and use far less steel and other materials. Think about how excited people would be for such a technology. It would sell like hotcakes. Mm. Of course, they were excited in 1903 when, <laughs> right. they, when they did compete directly. <laughs> um, That's true. You, you, you need to send me that link. That's beautiful. All yeah. right, I will. Yeah. yeah, I saw that too, Linnea. And you're right. It just people would be thrilled if all the vehicles were electric and all of a sudden this came along. Um, it, uh, but anyway, so there's this, we got this pink locomotive. Now the other company, EMD, is making one that isn't pink. Uh, win for marketing, right? Not pink. I mean, who wants a Pepto-Bismol locomotive? The little engine that couldn't. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but it's like the electric locomotive is fine if you're running from cantonary wires. You know, you're getting your power from a central or distributed generator network. That's worked for decades, and it's worked great. It's been wonderful for passenger service, but for freight service where you got to go through the mountains, you got to go through, you know, uh, huge grades up and down and curves and things like that. Is an electric locomotive really going to cut it? I mean, how do you put a charging station in the middle of the Colorado Rockies? Well, maybe they'll put a, a couple of tanker cars and a diesel generator there to well, recharge the electric engine once it gets up to that point. I don't know. You'll but have to build, you'll have to build a whole new sidings. So that when one is charging, it's not blocking the tracks or all the other rail traffic going through, right? Look, we already have diesel electric. It is actually among the most fuel efficient transportation modes in existence. Why do they think to need to replace it with, and I, look, I've, I'm not Superman. I've never tried to lift a diesel electric motive, uh, uh, locomotive. My suspicion is they're pretty dadgum heavy. Uh, but think how much heavier a battery-powered <laughs> uh, locomotive is. So how much of the the motive force, the power moving that, has to go just to hauling the uh, locomotive Batteries. itself, much less all the train cars that it's supposed to be hauling. It's yeah, yeah, and and it just I don't think it's going to take off just like the electric plane. I mean. The first train crash with an electric locomotive, well, that's going to be, you know, a fiery yeah. disaster that they can't put out for days, um, you know, unless they're using lead acid, but that's not likely to be practical. And the first electric airplane crash is going to basically kill that, just like the Hindenburg killed hydrogen-powered airships, right? That's well, you'd, gonna think, happen that. you'd hmm? think, but if, if that was going to kill an industry, this industry would already be dead. How many people have died from fires in automobiles, electric fires? How many houses have been destroyed? How many tenement buildings in New York from a scooter, from a dead gum scooter, not even a car, not even a big truck? Oh, the scooter caught fire. It was just sitting there. Burns the whole tenement down, kills the kids, and yet they're still on the roads, and the government's still pushing them. I'd like to think that the first time this happened, X, it would be over. But the evidence suggests the government doesn't care how many people these things kill. Oh, you have a point there. They don't seem to care at all. Um, we don't see 
these massive headlines that accompany these kinds of tragedies, like we would see, you know, from the Hindenburg, for example, we didn't see that kind of a revelation. Um, so, but you know, that's what it, 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 the whole thing is, is that it's about a narrative. You know, we have to do this to save the planet. And the narrative is not about facts. It's about repetition, right? Yep. Right. I think there's another element to this that is usually not talked about by people in our area because we tend to focus more on scientific and economic arguments. But I think there's also a an aesthetic argument against these electric trains <laughs> compared to like a steam engine. And that is that a steam engine is a beautiful piece of machinery. And I think our friends in Europe would agree with me on this. And that is that rail travel is is more beautiful and better <laughs> when it's a steam engine and it's nicer to look at from a distance mm -hmm. compared to the sterile you know i don't know kind of urbanite vibe of the uh of the electric cars it's not a good fun. argument it's not an argument that i would present <laughs> that i would present in a uh official capacity but it's one that i think about all the time is that Lin you know these Lin are okay i i don't like them though <laughs> Lin 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 would have us all go steampunk on all our technology yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well you know there's an there's the worst electric train out there is the one that hasn't been built yet in california they have the bullet train okay. right the elect and, and this thing has been going on for over a decade it was originally put to the voters who funded the bond, and then now it's gone like three times the expense. They still haven't got it built. And it isn't even practical because the the line that they set up for it basically goes uh, just up and down the, the San Joaquin Valley, just south of Sacramento down to Bakersfield. And then once you get to Bakersfield, you have to get on a bus to go to Los Angeles yeah. because they're not going to build a rail line you know, from Bakersfield to Los Angeles. So what good is it? I think Nothing. it was initially supposed to go from what San Francisco to uh, to, to Los Angeles or San Diego, even, you yeah. know, and and they've they've had to cut it back and cut it back. Now the route that they're actually they they promised they're going to build, it doesn't matter the cost. We just keep coming up with more money from taxpayers, uh, if not from the state, the federal government. Right. It's going to be a route that that nobody tr transverses. Right. You know, it's going to be from one small town to another small town, relative, you know, to California small towns. It's not. Going from a major metropolitan area to another, um, it is not a. It's true, not a single private company would ever have built this boondoggle. Yep. If it right. weren't for government, this would not get built. And why government decided this is a good idea to go from Bakersfield to where'd you say? I got nothing against Bakersfield. You know, I think Buck Owens came from Bakersfield, and maybe. Uh, Merle Haggard. So uh, nothing's wrong with Bakersfield, but it's not California's Mecca. Yeah. What and are you talking about? That's where the oil field is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. The oil field, the oil field, the oil field, which will not be powering this, <laughs> right. this train. Right. So here's the interesting thing about this whole concept of this, you know, bullet train. That's supposed to speed up travel between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have ever watched the Mythbusters program, but several years ago, the Mythbusters did a uh, a test to find out is it faster to drive between San Francisco and Los Angeles versus flying. And they ran this test. They ran a parallel test. Uh, one team went on you know planes, and the other one took the automobile. The automobile won. Why? Because you have to get to the airport, you have to park your car, you have to go through security, you have to check your luggage, you have to go through all of this preparatory stuff to get on the plane. And then, you know, the plane itself is actually faster for that short distance. But then it's the same reverse thing. You have to get out of the Los Angeles uh, airport, and that takes a long time. You got to get your baggage and all this other stuff, rent a car, and then drive to the location you want to go to. The car team beat the airplane by several minutes. And so it's going to be the same thing with the bullet train. 
it's still going to be faster to take a car and drive Interstate 5 or even Highway 101 going from San Francisco down to Los Angeles. So what have we gained? Nothing. We've gained our green virtue. Green, green in this in this instance means dollars, right? Because billions of dollars have been wasted. And speaking of billions of wasted dollars, uh, let's get back to automobiles because okay. you know we've talked about planes a little bit. There's not much to say. We've talked about trains. We probably said more than than it merits. Automobiles is where the action is at, and uh, the one of the wealthiest companies. In the history of mankind, Apple, this week canceled after spending billions of dollars, waste, not, not spending, wasting. How do you know it's wasted? They didn't create a single electric vehicle that worked. And now they're canceling the project. That tells you they took stockholders' money, they took money from their profits and put it into a project that failed. And so now they're pulling out. No, no Apple electric vehicles. Uh, Rivian gotten infusions from government. Its uh, its stock is tanked. They're firing, laying off workers. Fisker's already gone through bankruptcy once. It's now a penny stock. The second, the second iteration is now a penny stock. And it's probably going to go under. Um, <laughs> and Tesla, thanks to Joe Biden, is getting a lot of competition from China. Uh, so, yeah. Environmentally, we can get into that later, uh, but physically and economically, these don't make sense. I agree. Yeah, it's well, kind of too bad, too, with those Fiskers. I think it's a very pretty car. I like uh, the first iteration of Fisker. Yeah. You know, I looked into buying a used one. You know how long it was? It, the, the, the used Fiskers are not electric. They were electric hybrids. Do you know, do you know how far they could go on a charge without what? the gas? 28 miles. Mm, yeah, that's not ideal. <laughs> and then and then you got to bother with the fact that, well, they had leak, you know, it, it would rain and it would leak. They were like the DeLoreans of their day. Really good looking. Yeah. But, but not really very cool. functional. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, I was an early adopter of electric vehicles way back around 2004, 2005. And I thought, this is great. I really did at that time. Um, I've actually owned three electric vehicles. Uh, they were revolutionary for the time, and they were great for around town. But they all faced one fatal flaw, and that is the batteries would die. And um, I, I admit, I carried a small generator with me, right? Because I didn't want to be stuck somewhere. There was no place to charge it. And it's still almost that way today. I mean, yes, you've got them, um, you got chargers and so forth at, uh, you know, places like uh, Target uh, or you've got chargers like, uh, you know, along the highway and so forth. But, you know, they're still few and far between. And the problem is, is that people just don't want to worry about that range anxiety. They don't want to worry about, you know, losing a charge. They don't worry. They don't want to worry about the cold trying to get over the Sierra Nevada affecting the battery performance and basically meaning they can't get from San Francisco up to the ski resort, which has happened. There's been lots of vehicles towed off of Interstate 80 in the Sierra Nevada because they couldn't make the trip in cold weather. So what have we really gained here other than virtue signaling? I mean, that's really all this seems to be, right, Sterling? Well, they built, I'll say this, they built a lot of infrastructure. Uh we have about 160,000 gasoline stations, filling stations in this country. We already have 180,000 chargers. And yet the government says we need to build 500,000 more government finance. But the estimates are we need 1.2 million more. That's how effective um, electric vehicles are. We've got 200,000 more and we can't keep them on the road still. Um, the You talked about range anxiety. The problem with electric vehicles, there are multiple problems, but two main problems are range and costs. And you know what? That hasn't changed in nearly 200 years because why did the first electric locomotive not uh, compete? It didn't have range and it was too expensive, you know, when compared 
to the steam engines. Um, so that hasn't changed. All this investment, all these technological innovations, and the fundamental problem that's, that was around nearly 200 years ago is still around today, range and cost. Yeah, it's just like the environmental has taken out the dams. They're they're focused on this one tunnel vision aspect of it without looking at all the other things around it, the things that don't work. And they're not paying attention to that. For Jim, I'll say, dead gummit. Dead gummit? <laughs> oh, I my only goodness. said dead gummit because I was about to say something that probably I shouldn't say on this show. So. <laughs> right. Well, that's where all the best Southernisms come from, too. Exactly. Yeah. So here's the only thing I can really see valuable about electric cars in the future. This is me in 2050. I don't know if I've showed you a picture of my 1950 hot rod. It's not this one, but, you know, I've got a 1950 Chevy 3100 hot rod, which I intend to keep until the day I die. And this is going to be me in 2050 out running the cop waiting for his electric battery to die. Just wait. I can't wait. It's going to be fun. <laughs> I think um, I think so. My sister and I, when we used to go visit my grandparents in California. I think California has the most car chases I've ever seen shown on the news, like on television. If you're anywhere near Los Angeles and you're getting Los Angeles news, there's just a car chase like three times a day to watch. <laughs> and so we used to watch these things and they would be so uh, anticlimactic most of the time. Um, they would be going on and on and on. They would be driving for, I don't know, maybe like an hour sometimes. You know, it's not like the cops were trying to ram them off the road or anything like that. It would just be there following him at a reasonable distance until they stopped. And I imagine that in an electric car scenario, those those cops better hope that their car is uh, charged fully before they get on the road there, especially well, in Los Angeles. You know, the O.J. Simpson chase would have been a lot more anticlimactic if he that. if if he had been in an electric vehicle himself. Maybe what we should do is ban internal combustion engines for criminals. Only give go. them electric vehicles. Uh, uh, say, you know, are you a bank robber? Here's the car that will allow you to do your getaway in. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it'll be just like guns when uh, internal combustion engines are banned, only uh, criminals will have internal combustion engines. Um, yeah, but that's a lot harder. To, I, I'll say this that's a lot harder to hide, or uh, uh, you know, it's much more visible than uh, than a firearm. That's true, that's true. All right, let's go on to our question and answer period to see what some of our viewers have come up with for questions or comments today. Lynette, take it away. All righty. So first, right away, I want to say our audience is really funny. I'm bringing this up again. We could have the Dukes of Fire Hazard. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorites of today, but you guys are all very, very funny. Um, <clears throat> all right. So for questions today, we only have three, but first we're going to go for Alan Griffiths, who gave us a 10 pound super chat uh he says tony heller has 124,000 subscribers compared to yours 57,000 conservative political commentators such as liberal hive mind have over 1 million why are climate skeptics getting such little traction well i can answer that uh face or, or pretty much everyone uh facebook also twitter still uh if you search for the heartland institute's uh tweet like Twitter account it, or X account, it does not come up. You have to find someone who has the Heartland Institute uh, linked page in their bio or something in order to find the Heartland Institute. Um, YouTube hates us very, very much. <laughs> um, and so pretty much anything that is climate related that is not towing the official narrative is heavily suppressed. It's part of the reason why so many conservative commentator organizations that are bigger companies almost never talk about the climate issue. It's because it is poison for viewership um, because the censors come down so hard on you for it. So yeah, we're, I mean, look, we're shadow banned still pretty much everywhere. Shadow that's part ban of it. It's not just us, of course. Uh, LinkedIn yeah. is another one that shadow bans people. Look, if I'm on Facebook and I want to share something on Facebook, 
I could I could go through my list and start click, clicking. But typically, when I want to share something on climate, if it's not just vacation photos, uh, I, I'm limited to five shares. Someone passes me along something, it's limited to five shares. Um, now, that, that affects, by the way, my vacation photos, because when you get shadow banned for a while, uh, even those get limited to five shares for a while. But the point is, um, it's harder. We have less access. We don't control the media source. They're supposed to be, I'm told, that they are not publishers. They're just neutral outlets for people to exchange ideas and converse. I believe that's what Facebook and them are or have sold themselves as to get their exemption from, uh, from, uh, um, you know, uh, being sued for what's posted on their site. They said, no, 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 we didn't post this. We we're not arbiters of content. We're just a neutral site where people post what they want. We know that's a lie. Right. Yep. There was a um, comment there about censoring something only validates it. And that's true. I mean, we've had a number of our articles with the Heartland Institute attacked by fact checkers and so forth. And they really don't deal with the facts. They, they can't dispute the facts. They just get some people with opinions on and say, well, we don't think that this is valid or we don't subscribe to that or whatever. They don't actually get and, and knock down the facts we presented because we present factual information and we make sure it's backed up. I mean, I can't ever recall a time when we've gotten one of our facts that we've published wrong. But the, the censors and the fact checkers out there, they just throw opinion and mud at it in order to try to smack it down. Yeah, we, right. we, this we present data. A good point from Jim as well, that this show is also on Rumble. Um, where we and we are starting to get more viewership there, he says, but we need YouTube because it's by far the number one place that people watch shows like this. So we're going to be on here until they kick us off, um, which who knows in the tank, <laughs> in the tank had to move to a different channel so that we didn't get uh, both of us knocked down if one of us did. So um, it's a little bit, yeah, we're, we're playing, we're threading the needle on it. Um, we don't, self-censor in terms of our content at all. So you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, it is, um, it's always a struggle. Okay, let's see. William says, I saw a post on social media, so it must be true that atmospheric O2 is falling. Do you agree? If so, why? You know, if it is, and I've seen some hints of this, if, if it is, it's very subtle. Um, some atmospheric oxygen escapes into space uh, just simply by the action of the sun knocking molecules off into space from cosmic rays and solar wind and so forth and so on. But I don't think we're actually in an oxygen depletion problem, uh, particularly <laughs> since carbon dioxide has increased over the past uh, several decades. We've got a greening of the earth going on. And so there's more photosynthesis going on. Uh, in, uh, in fact, NASA satellites have measured an area the size of the United States increase in greening throughout the world since about 1990. So what does that mean? More oxygen. And I've got no idea. I, I haven't heard that. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's an issue. Um, right. But go ahead. Okay, so we also have... This one from Energy Colonizer. Uh, why were so many climate cluckers dissatisfied with the Copenhagen Accords in the era when the UN and others actually tolerated debate? And my question to you, Anthony, would be, do you think that they really did tolerate debate or that they just hadn't figured out yet that they could clamp down uh, as oh, severely as they do now? That's, that's, that's what they were dissatisfied about. <laughs> In that era, they still had debate, and they weren't happy about that. So that's why right. they were dissatisfied. Yeah, I, and, I will and, point out, when I first started doing blogging about climate change back in 2006, 2007 era, uh, there was actually a fair amount of debate. And my articles would get picked up, you know, where we I would point out something factual. But today that doesn't happen because there's just this universal clampdown by the media and the media uh, platforms to basically say, oh, well, they're just deniers. Don't listen to them. 
It doesn't matter what the argument is or how factual it is. They're more interested in just simply not allowing it. Yep, and uh, it's it's the same. It's the same thing with all the social media groups. And, and if you spend any time around conservative media in general, then you know that um, we've got something of a situation here where our uh, social media and the internet uh, kind of gatekeepers have really gone hard the last couple of years, acting like a fourth branch of government, um, enforcing whatever the federal agencies want them to enforce um, when it comes to the unnameable virus that we don't want <laughs> that we don't <laughs> want to bring up on this particular show because it's uh, <laughs> except in the uh, situation where we talk about how carbon dioxide levels dropped uh, it, but not as not much as named. anyone was expecting <laughs> during that time um, and it's uh Anything you try to say about that obviously gets censored very abruptly um, and very harshly, too. And if you look on our video right now, I do not have the YouTube link pulled up like I normally do at the moment, but I'm sure that we already have a Wikipedia link underneath the description of this video uh, trying to fact check climate change on us. So, you know, it's, it's the way it is. And we, as people are talking about in the comments, people get unsubscribed even from our channels all the time. Um, it's just, it's an uphill battle, but I think that we're doing pretty well considering um, all the challenges that we have. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. No, we don't we have, have an uphill battle every day. Wow, we're actually not getting fact checked yet. Well, we'll see when the video goes up, what happens. All righty. So it looks like that's all the questions we have today. Uh, and uh, we're going to move on and uh, let everyone have a fantastic weekend. So uh, that guy on the left say, is really good looking. What's that? That guy on the left is really good looking. Yeah. As yeah, your well, face he seems surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the Google, you know, the AOC, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Matt, Adam Schiff eyes. He's, it, he's is Adam Adam Adam. Yeah, it is Adam Schiff eyes. <laughs> yeah, it is Adam Schiff eyes. That's a song. I, you know, if we could just get that. Uh, what was the name of that song? Betty Davis eyes. He, she's yeah. got Betty Davis eyes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I want to remind everyone to visit our websites, climaterealism.com, where we daily shoot down the media. We impale them with facts and we point out where they're wrong every day. Visit that. Uh, climateataglance.com, where we have all the facts correlated in simple one or two page summary about particular climate topics. Now, we do that on a regular basis. We have one or two new articles per month getting into the different climate topics, and we've already got dozens up there that you can use for reference to factually shoot down some of the arguments that you encounter on the internet. We also have energyataglance.com, and energyataglance.com is Linnea's big project that talked about all the different aspects of energy from fracking to electric generation to natural gas to everything else. And of course, my own namesake, what's up with that.com, where the it is the leading climate website in the world. And we've survived and outlived all of the other naysayers out there and continue to flourish even despite the odds. So I want you to visit all those. So Sterling and Linnea, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for your expert commentary. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute, wishing you a great Friday and a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye. Who's a lion's dog-faced pony soldier?